Okay, guys, welcome back. So in this part, we'll cover cardiac auscultation again. Um, there is an entire series of videos on these skills. So um, this will just kind of cover some of those key concepts of like the, the, I guess the science really behind auscultation. So um, again, you know, everything that we're listening to kind of corresponds to an event occurring in the heart. So when we're listening to auscultation of the heart. We're, we're listening to the valves close, right? It's the closure of valves at different points throughout the cardiac cycle. So for example, the first cardiac sounds, or we, all, we call S1, it's actually a combination of the closure. Let me get my little guy, my little pen. Where is he? There we go. Um, a closure of the mitral and tricuspid valves, right? As we start to get to isovolumetric contraction, right? So um, we've got that volume, it has, you know, stay the same. We are increasing pressure, increasing pressure, increasing pressure until the valves um, open, right? And we, you know, end up ejecting blood. So we see pressure begin to rapidly decrease um, you know, as the valves have opened and egress blood until um, we get, lost my little pen again, uh, the point where the valves close and we resume diastole, right? So again, uh, which is hallmarked by you know, the closure of the semilunar valves, aortic and pulmonic, creating our S2. So S1 is actually a combination of two sounds, mitral and tricuspid closing, marking the end of diastole and the beginning of systole. And then um, the S2 or the second or the dub sound that we hear in auscultation is a combination of the aortic and pulmonic valves closing at the end of systole, marking the beginning of diastole um, as the heart has relaxed and returned to passive filling uh, to complete another cycle. And this all corresponds to different events along the electrical um, you know, conduction system, the heart, the ECG, but just remembering what we're, what we're listening to and why we're listening to it, right? So auscultation uh, should always involve listening to those, the four auscultation areas. And I want to stress that these are areas, right? Um, and we'll get into like why that matters in a bit. We're not listening like to right over the region where those valves are located, Right, we're listening to where the, they actually he, we hear them the best. So again, you know, we'll, we'll get into aortic region, pulmonic region, tricuspid region, mitral region. But again, we're, these are regions, not you know the exact anatomical location of where like those valves are located. And it'll make more sense in a bit. Um, and we auscultate uh, starting with the aortic region, which we have here um, on the right second intercostal space parasternal border, followed by the pulmonic on the left, so go right, left, on the left parasternal border, second intercostal space, followed by the tricuspid space, which again, fourth intercostal space. You could also use a fifth if you wanted to, depending on the anatomy, parasternal border. And then our mitral valve is, you know, we listen to that at the fifth or fourth intercostal space at the mid-clavicular line, right? So um, we go in order, aortic, pulmonic, tricuspid, mitral, um, you know, we auscultate, and you can remember this by this mnemonic, all physicians take money, so aortic, pulmonic, tricuspid, mitral, or all physical therapists move, right? Or maybe mobilize, maybe that's a better way to look at it. So. Again, we start at the aortic region and then work our way um, to each different uh, valve. Now, I want to stress again, these are not where these valves are located anatomically. It's just where we hear them the best. Um, and we're, when we're listening, we should be typically be listening with the diaphragm of the stethoscope, the flat part. Um, there are some conditions where you might want to use the, um, the, the, the bell. But in this example, for most situations, we're going to be using the diaphragm. Now, um, we will hear all of the valves, right? We'll, we'll hear the S1 and S2, we'll get what that means in a bit. And any region, it's just these regions are where we hear those particular valves a little bit more clearly 
than others, right? So that we will hear lub and dub, which again are combinations of, of, of two valves closing for each cardiac sound, but um, we'll, you know, but we'll hear them more pronounced in, over these different regions again, which are not where they are located anatomically, just where they're heard the best. Apical pulse, I will talk touch on that again. Um, if we don't have access to an ECG and say we detect, you know, someone's dropping some beats or has an irregular rhythm when we're palpating, you know, pulse rate. Um, if we want to get a measure of heart and we don't have an ECG or a polar device, you can actually listen to the heart directly, right? So uh, you know, we listen over an area called the point of maximum impulse, which is really kind of in the, you know, the, the mitral region with that fifth intercostal space, mid clavicular align. Um, which is where we hear the, the heart kind of the most pronounced, actually. Um, and each lub-dub, lub-dub, lub-dub sound counts as one beat, because again, it's, you know, that's a completion of a cardiac cycle. That is, you know, the, you know again, mitral valve, tricuspid closure, a aortic pul pulmonic, you know, closure, right? S1, S2. So um, sometimes we can detect irregular rhythms uh, by hearing some funky beats, right? Or a, a prolongated pause or stuff like that. So if you ever want to get a real you know, good assessment of whether or not someone's pulses are abnormal. You can listen to the heart directly. Um, and, uh, you know, you could even, you know, to help rule out maybe there is something downstream in the arteries, right? So you can listen to the heart. If the heart sounds normal and the rhythm is normal, yet the pulse you're feeling is abnormal, maybe there's some blockage somewhere along the path from the blood leaving the heart down to where you're palpating, maybe on the radial artery or, you know, you know, the carotid, which would be less likely. But again, remember sometimes, you know, maybe there's, you know, something along the way, the blood's got to travel a little bit of a distance. So apical pulse measurement, again, it's, it's the most accurate way of getting heart rate because you're listening directly to the heart outside of having an ECG, um, you know, or looking at an echocardiogram, which is visualizing the heart beating. Uh, so normal sounds again, lub, which is the sound, the first heart sound. Um, it's closure of the AV valves, tricuspid and mitral. Remember, we looked at that little graph. It's a combination of those sounds together. It occurs um, with ventricular contraction, because again, we want those valves closed as the ventricle begins to go through that isovolumetric contraction, the raised pressure. Um, marks beginning of systole. Now, the dub, right, um, is the closure of the aortic valves and the aortic valve and pulmonic valve, or semilunar valves, which marks the end of systole. Um, it's a little bit shorter in duration, a little bit higher frequency. We have some you know, recordings for you guys to listen to get a better appreciation for what this sounds like. My, my recommendation, you guys, is just practice listening to other people so you get a, you know, again, it's a better understanding of what normal sounds like. Um, so again, lub, the first sound, dub, the second heart sound. You might be asking me, well, how do I tell, right? Because when you listen to heart, it, it sounds kind of similar. Um, if you palpate, and again, which is why I, we talked about the apical pulse and that stuff, but if you palpate the artery and, you know, you get a, a good feel for the pulse, the sound that you hear when you feel the pulse is the S1 sound. Right, because that the pulse you're feeling is the beginning of systole, right? It's that downstream pressure wave. So it can help orient you if you can't really get a, a, a grasp. So am I listening to the first heart sound or the second heart sound? You can palpate the artery and try to time it and whatever you know one's occurring at the same time, that's that's the S1 sound. So we'll, next we'll get to some abnormal heart sounds. So we've got splitting um, S1. So again, like the S1 sound is really two, is two, two different sounds occurring at the same time. Again, left and right typically occur within microseconds of each other, but sometimes there can be a little bit discordant where you hear a, a very distinct, you know, mitral sound and tricuspid sound or, 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 or asynchronous. Now, um, sometimes it's a very narrow splitting, not something to be too concerned about, but uh, a very wide splitting where there's a very pronounced widening of that first sound should warrant a, foreign, um, uh, uh, a further medical examination. And then splitting S2, similar thing, the second heart sound is a little bit wider. Now, uh, both with S1 and S2, um, if you take a deep breath in, as you breathe in, you, that, that may cause the sounds to widen a little bit, especially the second heart sounds. We call that a physiological splitting. We see that more often in very healthy individuals, as well as kids, athletes, 
where if they take a deep breath in, that, that second heart sound especially widens a little bit. It should get a little bit approximated if they bear down and we increase thoracic pressure by like you know, doing a Valsalva or something of that nature. Now, um, you know, that's, that's how that would typically respond. So it fluctuates due to thoracic pressure. Now, if that split sound does not fluctuate, especially an S2, does not fluctuate no matter if we are taking a breath in or holding or bearing down, that's what we call a persistent or a fixed split S2. That's always um, you know, an abnormal sign. It's never normal. Um, and if we, if we notice that, um, this persistent splitting, you know, that indicates likely there's some sort of cardiac defect, often hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. So it's a pretty, pretty noticeable one. Um, and that would warrant further medical examination. Uh, and then we'll get into extra sounds and gallops. So uh, we have our S3 and our S4 sounds. So we call these extra sounds because these are sounds. It's not a splitting of S1 or S2. It's a completely additional sound. So S3 would be an additional sound or an extra heart sound that occurs right at the beginning of diastole. So it happens right after S2, right? Uh, it's a little bit lower pitched, right? Uh, it's not a, it's, it sounds a little bit different. It's indicative of ventricular failure or, or dilated ventricles because you end up having, um, if you have like heart failure, for example, or a dilated ventricle, when blood enters into the ventricle, it's it's turbulent in this in 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 someone with ventricular failure or heart failure, um, it causes the blood to slosh in, creating turbulence. So we could you know, we we term this as you know sloshing in. It's kind of what it sounds like slosh in, slosh in. So again, we have our normal S1, an S2, and then an extra sound right at the beginning of diastole. Um, again, after, right after those AV valve, or those uh, semilunar valves close. S4 will occur right before S1. So it occurs right at the beginning of systole, and, or right prior to systole. This is due to turbulent blood in the left ventricle um, because it's stiff and hypertrophied. Remember, before the ventricles contract, the atria contract and pump that little bit of extra 20% in the ventricle, right, that, that atrial kick. Now, if you get a very stiff or hypertrophied ventricle, it's gonna create some turbulence and you get an extra sound. So we call that an S4 sound. And again, it sounds like, a, you know, I mean, like the mnemonic we use, remember it, a stiff wall, right? So a sound occurs right before S1, right? So S4 occurring right before we go into systole. Now, Best way to kind of frame this with anything, like how do I tell the difference between, you know, S3, S4, or these splits? Realistically, what you can do is try those breath hold techniques. Again, if, it, if none of these change, that's never a good sign. And sometimes it takes a very trained ear to determine, is this a splitting sound or a gallop? These extra heart sounds, which we call gallops, S3 or S4 gallops. Um, you know, and sometimes you can have an S3 and an S4 gallop, right? If any of these sounds don't change with those breath holding techniques or deep breath techniques, you know, that's an indicate, it's indicating that that's something, there's a fixed deformity in the heart and warrants further medical examination. You don't have to get too specific. You can have a pretty good idea, is this S3 or S4? Either way, it's a referral if it's not a known sign or not previously uh, diagnosed. Um, so murmurs again, murmurs are onomatopoeias. There's there are extra sounds that occur during the cardiac cycle, like a whooshing or swishing, due to turbulent flow, often as a result of a faulty valve. Um, we talked about all the different conditions that create it. We talked about friction rubs, which are often due to pericarditis. Now, when we're classifying a murmur, right, they should be you know characterized over the shape. Do they get louder and crescendo? Do they decrescendo? Do they get louder and come down? Um, or say, are they loud and come down, or do they, you know, go up and come down, crescendo, decrescendo? Are they plateaued? Where do we hear it the best? Is it over the aortic, pulmonic, tricuspid, and mitral regions? Again, we should be listening to all of them, and we'll hear their murmur in every region. It just might be more pronounced, right, in those in those you know, different regions. Timing is it occurring during systole, right, which would mean we would hear it after the first heart sound, right, and then would kind of subside. Um, after the second heart sound, right? Remember the period between S1, S2 is systole. Um, is it occurring diastole, 
right? Is it continuous? Do we hear it constantly? Is it intense, right? Is it kind of faint? Is it loud? And there are some that are so loud you can actually hear it without even having to have a stethoscope. Um, called this like a thrill. Uh, very, 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 um, you know, very, very significant murmurs. Um, if you have very significant valve disorders. Is it a high pitch? Is it a low pitch? Now, I've got that murmur rev uh, review chart for you guys to go through, um, and we'll, we'll cover uh, that as well, um, you know, when we get into the technique. Now, there is one additional technique that we'll go over, dynamic auscultation, which refers to using maneuvers to alter the uh, you know, different hemodynamic parameters. Some murmurs are better appreciated if people bear down or squat or stand, different things like that. The, the most notable one is uh, aortic stenosis and hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, um, which we can use without salvo maneuver or sitting and standing. So aortic stenosis and hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, which are both structural defects to the heart, they both have systolic murmurs. And so it's kind of hard sometimes to tell, determine like which one's called, like which, which is actually going on here. If the murmur, the systolic murmur gets louder, right? So if this murmur gets louder when someone does a Valsalva maneuver, that indicates probably hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, right? Um, or it doesn't change as much. If it gets softer, right, that's probably aortic stenosis. Another one we can do is squatting and standing, right? So the murmur of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, again, they're both systolic murmurs. Um, tends to get softer as you squat and a little bit louder um, as you stand. So again, the murmur of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy gets softer in squatting, louder in standing, louder with Valsalva. The, the murmur of aortic stenosis, stenosis is just the opposite. It gets a little bit louder in squatting, a little bit softer. In, in standing a little bit softer with Valsalva. So this is really useful when we're doing pre-participation screening in athletes, which we'll learn about next week. So in summary, again, we wanna make sure that we know where we're hearing the murmur, what phase, location that it's the loudest, change the position, any other symptoms like orthopnea or dis dizziness, palpitations is, you know, and again, we have those different types of um, conditions associated with systolic murmurs diastolic murmurs um, in different different presentations. So that was auscultation in a nutshell. Again, this is really more designed to supplement the, the technique videos uh, that you guys have available to you. So uh, well, that will conclude this, this unit. Thank, uh, take care. Thank you.